episode 13 of the Rogue Writers Podcast. We're the podcast by writers, for writers, sharing our personal experience from very different backgrounds. Today we're discussing music and the writing process. But first, I have three talented people here with me, so let's meet them now. For intros, we'll say our name, what we do, and talk about an opportunity we've had to meet a musician we've really liked, or if that hasn't been the case, you can discuss a um, concert that you've been to, the most memorable or the best concert you've been to. So, um, Nick, do you want to start? Sure, yeah, I'll start us out. My name's Nick. I'm a copywriter and SEO and freelance writer. And uh, I've been to probably over a dozen concerts in my life. My first was Metallica. And uh, I've never met a musician personally, but I've been to some very memorable concerts. And one I'm going to talk about is Guar. I've seen them three times, and they're by far unlike any other concert you could even dream of. I mean, it's just pure insanity. So the House of Blues in Orlando, I've been there to see the Wallflowers. I've been there to see Fiona Apple. So it's a very classy place. So when I got there to see Guar with my girlfriend and my little brother at the time, it was plastic all over the tapestry, all over the upper balconies, all over the walls. I'm like, what the hell am I getting myself into? <laughs> so you get into Guar, and anybody you're going with tells you wear a white shirt, just purely a white T-shirt. And the reason is, because, I mean, they come out, there's a whole tale, there's lore behind it. You know, they're alien, you know, they're whatever aliens who came to <laughs> conquer their costumes. Their guitars have big blades on them. And anyway, they did a Bill Clinton skit that ended up where they slashed his head off and then just blood sprays all over the friggin' audience and just pure mayhem. And the whole time, from the second they're playing a note to the second it's silence, it's nonstop just mayhem. Like, there's, you're either blocking high because there's moshers who are, like, kicking you in the head up here, and then you're getting elbowed in the gut. So you're like, oh, man, so you're down here. And uh, it's just... It's like, it's like 10 workouts in one just going to a Guar concert, just fighting to stay standing. So that was definitely the most aggressive one I've seen. But recently I've seen uh, 30 Seconds to Mars and even Zach Brown Band here in California. Both were excellent. But, uh, yeah, Guar has to be the most memorable for sure. I, I never – moshers, I never heard – that is a noun. Um, is moshing still a thing? Or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. depending on the shows you go to. Because, I mean, when you know when you go to a concert, it's just so loud. So you have the loud, aggressive music. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, you see people doing whatever, whether they're getting super violent or whether they're just bumping into each other. There's all levels of a mosh pit. I've definitely seen a guy when I was at OzFest 98 where uh, he was a little dude with a punk haircut, and there was this bigger guy who was being a bully and just kind of knocking people over, girls, whatever, and just was knocking them around. And this dude just went up and threw one right hook, and that dude just went down. And, like, nobody saw who did it. Everyone just went back to their spaces. So mosh pits can be pretty crazy. But. My, uh, my group of friends from high school, when we were in high school, used to be really into ska music. And, like, mosh pits are big things at ska concerts. Oh, yeah, and ska. And the problem with that being when you're only, like, four foot something, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the number of times that I walked out of there with, like, black eyes oh, and yeah. bruised cheekbones and... <laughs> Well, being sure, though, you should have been crowd surfing. And, like, you could easily, no, 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 could easily toss no, you across see, the room. See, here's my thing. is like I'm short, and I'm used to being close to the ground, and that's where I prefer to stay. Yeah, uh, I got gotcha. you. Um, but I don't know. Like there, there are some like there are different levels of mosh pits, but for the most part, people in mosh pits, there's like not really a sense of decorum, but like a sense of rule. Somebody trips and falls over, everybody picks them up, make sure they're back on their feet so they can get stepped on. Like I would say that depends if you're at like Pennywise versus yeah. Slayer or like a band that's pure evil, like Cradle of Filth or something. Because <laughs> you're attracting such different people, whether it's, oh, college kids and we like upbeat music, or you're with people who've been wearing eyeliner since they were 12 <laughs> and are just like wanting to destroy people. But, uh, wow, yeah. It's, that's... That's true. I've seen like all levels, like ones where the pe- people just don't care. Yeah. And then more like that one. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Whenever we would go out, there was always like, like things would get crazy for sure. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying people didn't get hurt because they probably definitely did. Yeah. But, you know, there was also like kind of a check on it in sense of like, 
unnecessary violence. Or it was like, still seen as like, hey, this is they, playful. We don't want anyone yeah, really like getting it's, hurt. It's meant gotcha. so that we can all be here to have a good time. And like, yeah. there have definitely been times where the bands that we've been seeing have literally stopped their shows. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. And been like, okay, what are you guys you doing? Little twerps, like, knock <laughs> yeah. it off. <laughs> yeah. You're like 15, I, stop. Like, you know. And, yeah. Like, I saw Blues Traveler at the UCF homecoming. I'm like, why are people even moshing to this? Really? <laughs> 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 I was like, no, why are you going to uh, give me the run? And they're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, what the hell are you guys doing, man? Any, any but, excuse to, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or even in the Metallica show, I remember. Like, we're in a, you know, good seats, like, high high value production. I mean, he's doing stuff like by himself, playing Nothing Else Matters. And there's people moshing down there to the friggin' minute. It's like, dude, just sit there and enjoy the show. No, Are you going to mosh to a house? and watch a Metallica concert. Like, that's, no. <laughs> I, I don't know. That one makes a little bit more sense to me than, like, the Blues Travelers. Like, that's <laughs> yeah, a little yeah, out there. Just, yeah. I gotcha, I gotcha. <laughs> I was there to appreciate the music that time. So. Yeah, I mean. We all appreciate our music in different ways, right? Like, some That's of us true. are very much just like, let's sit and listen and enjoy. And well, it depends on the band for me. Like, Tool, there's monsters. I'm like, no way. I'm watching every second of Tool, you know. Celine I think that, Dion or something. <laughs> I think that also depends, like, where your seats are. Like, if you're sitting up in, like, That's true. If you have good seats like, or not. You're not going to be moshing down the steps of an auditorium. Like, you're <laughs> yeah. going to trip and kill yourself. True. But, like, yeah. if you're down on the floor, it's a little bit different experience. Yeah. Or if it's, like, a really small show. That's a good but. point. Yeah. All right, Tessa. All right, um, I'm Tessa. I'm the PPC specialist here. Um, and I've been very, very lucky to go to quite a few cool concerts and meet quite a few cool bands in my day. Um, I've always been super into music, so concerts were like one of the things that I, I would save up money for. And, like, you know, there was never a concert that I would go to that you could convince me it wasn't worth the money to spend on tickets. Um, but I think one of the coolest experiences was I've always been really into country music, too. And um, one of my favorite artists, Dustin Lynch, came to Denver and he was playing at this little place called the Grizzly Rose, which is like a dance hall. And it's a small venue. And this is before, you know, he was going out and headlining, you know, national tours and all this stuff. And um, he, after the concert, everybody was like pushing up against the stage, like waving their hats and stuff in the air, trying to get him to sign shit. And in the end, he was like, you know what, I'm just going to go stand over at the merch table and you guys can come over and you can say hi and all that kind of stuff. And um, so we got to go back and, and meet him. And it was a really cool experience because I feel like sometimes when you meet the artists that you love so much, like, their personalities don't really match. Like, oh, yes. That what is my you, story. Like, <laughs> like, what you picture them to be in your head. And he's definitely not. Like, he's the, he's the person who's, like, persona on stage. 100% matches, like, who he is yeah. as a person and how he interacts with fans and things like that. And it was funny because I had gotten separated from my friend that I had gone with. And I finally got up and I was, you know, talking to Dustin and all that and, like, got him to sign my, my hat and things like that. And my phone had died, so I couldn't get a picture. Oh. So I asked a random guy behind me in line <laughs> to take a picture and text it to me. But I had no way of knowing whether that was actually going to be a thing yeah. until I got home and was able to charge my phone. But then, you know, obviously it would have been too late. <laughs> and uh, I got home and charged my phone. And sure enough, he'd actually text me the through. picture and, nice. and stuff like that. Nasty so it was, route, right? Yeah, it was, it, was, uh, <laughs> it was really cool. It was a fun experience. I've done that. I've met the Plain White Tees. Okay. I've met the band's Parachute. Um, when I went to a Goo Goo Dolls concert, because I'm an old soul and it's fine. But... Um, yeah, so it's. I've always been a huge music junkie. I take every opportunity I can to nice. get to interact with the area. It's interesting how some people spend money on experiences and then other people, it's like things yeah. or like upgrading their car. And I've always been like, spend money on experiences. Yeah, and, for sure. Hold on. Okay, yeah, I'm Richard. Ahead. You know, it's funny when you were talking about a band stopping, I. Totally, until right now, I'd completely forgotten about this. Um, I saw X at a theater. This was back in the big L.A. punk days. Like, oh, and, and okay. X and Black Flag. Sure. Circle Jerk. Henry there. Rollins. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, <laughs> X, but X was like, and Black Flag back then were the two biggest of that whole scene. And mm -hmm. and um, I saw them, um, I saw them a couple times. I saw them once at the Roxy. 
But I also saw them when there was a lot of slam dancing going on. They didn't call it mosh, they called it slam dancing <laughs> sure. back then. Right. That's an accurate description. There's a difference between mo- moshing and slam dancing, um, but I don't know. Yeah. I, <laughs> I think difference. it's all just yes. the same. Yes. Yes. I know. Yes. Disaster. Yes. Really yes. Yes. Gary yeah. knows Brooke yeah. doing both <laughs> but, of them. <laughs> but the other time I saw Axel was at a theater, and the entire entire night there was like a war going on. It's almost like the movie Give Me Shelter, except nobody got killed at the end. <laughs> um, but there was a war going on between the band and the people in the audience, and the bound at this little theater who were just being jerks the whole time. They were telling people to sit down. They were just saying, don't get up, don't dance, don't do anything. And X was just really mad at the, at the whole scene. And, and, and it, in the middle, the music just stopped cold, right in the middle of the song. And, and X scene said, don't take him, he's with us. And the bouncers were like dragging this guy away because, I don't know why, because he was getting too wild, and he was one of the roadies. <laughs> nice. And so... He, he, the bouncer let him go and he crawled up on stage and walked out the back oh, and man. then like finally like for the last song uh, like they said okay you can dance in front of your seats but I don't even know if they did an encore I mean it was yeah. a really wow. giant mess yeah. um, <clears throat> actually speaking of the Rolling Stones because um, I mentioned Give Me Shelly anybody ever see that movie that's a it, I have and I am a fan of the Rolling Stones it's, it's, a, it's a true story about when um the Rolling Stones got the brilliant idea of hiring Hell's Angels to be bouncers nice. at a nice. concert in Altamont, and they were going to give a free idea. concert. Well, they stabbed a guy to death. Um, yeah, and uh, Sorry, that's hated when that happened. Yeah. Hey, that's but, always security. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, Hell's <laughs> Angels are like, what? It's part of the job. Yeah, right. right. What were you thinking when you hired the Hell's Shit. Angels to be your bouncer? strict orders. Yeah. Kill yeah. anyone who right. gets near us. Right? Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's very... But, but I actually saw the Rolling Stones at the Coliseum, and one of their warmer groups was Prince, who nobody had heard of at the time. And this was in the Tattoo You Tour. So speaking of, there were a lot of everybody with the tattoo and a lot of biker style people were in the audience. And they totally didn't take the Prince at all. And they oh, booed him yeah. off. They threw bottles at him and booed him off the stage after like two oh, songs. Not yeah. Pretty notorious. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the people still talk about that, that notorious concert. Anyways, um, some other concerts that were memorable. Um, I kind of feel like, although this is a post hoc fallacy, I kind of feel like I killed Dizzy Gillespie and Miles Davis because I actually saw both of their last concerts before wow. they died. Um, the Dizzy Gillespie, I saw him in a place called Yoshi's and an open, very famous place where a lot of jazz concerts are recorded. And it was really kind of sad because the whole night he was brooding about how old he was and how all his contemporaries are dead, Damn. making all these inappropriate comments. The waitress said, Can I get you anything? He said, Yeah, bring me a joint. And um, <laughs> and then he made a homophobic comment, um, wow. and people were like hissing and booing Dizzy Gillespie. And on the way out, one one because you know it's a progressive area, and, and the way out woman said he picked the wrong house to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, so, but that was a really interesting uh, concert. And I'm glad I got to see Miles Davis. Um, and then um, I never personally had like a brush with greatness, but <laughs> when I was in college, my roommate. Um, was a bellhop at the Claremont Hotel, which is a really nice hotel. Yeah. And Bob Dylan was touring with uh, The Alarm, which is a rinky-dink little Scottish band whose only hit was 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 the Al Green song, Take Me to the River, for about 12 minutes. Uh, obviously, <laughs> I don't have a big opinion of The Alarm, and you're going to see why in a second. Sure. Um, so so my friend is the bellhop with his goofy little bellhop uniform and his goofy little red bellhop hat, you know, and um, and he's carrying their Bob Dylan's luggage and the alarm guy's luggage and he's sitting in it. He's in the elevator with uh, he's right behind him and he and he's thinking the whole time should I you know he's not supposed to talk to these people not supposed to bother him but should I talk to him it's Bob Dylan I'm never gonna get a chance to talk to Bob Dylan you know, his, his inner dialogue and finally he says I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to him so he says I don't mean to be a pest but. And the guy from the alarm turned around and said, "Then don't." <laughs> and that was his that was his brush with greatness. Right? Nice. I just talked to Bob Dylan. <laughs> That's was awesome, jerk. Okay, and I will pass it on to Amy. Okay, hi, I'm Amy, and I'm a copywriter and SEO associate here. Um, so, I I I've been to a lot of concerts. I I think I got obsessed with music when I was like twelve or thirteen, and. Um, I don't even know. I, I've seen like Metallica six times. I think. Holy crap! <laughs> That's a lot of Manson, times. Like five or six times. That's I don't know awesome. how that happened. And the Cure, my all-time favorite band, like three times. But anyway, um, but I've been to so many concerts I can't even count them all. <laughs> but um, so when I was like thirteen or fourteen, I loved the band Slaughter, 
And if you don't know, they're like an early 90s hair band. <laughs> yeah. <Yep>. Um, <laughs> so somehow I like Slaughter and Metallica. I had eclectic taste, I guess. I don't know. Um, so they later, when I was like 21 or 22, they came to a small bar in my hometown. And I had a chance to see them. And then actually meet them afterwards. They like opened up their tour bus so we could all oh, go nice. on. But it was a bit disappointing because the lead singer, who I guess I had a crush on when I was little, or 13, <laughs> 14, uh, he was just a big asshole. And he just acted like he was better than everybody oh, and like man. he shouldn't be there. But I suppose he went from, you know, playing huge stadiums to a tiny bar in. You know, middle of nowhere, so karma basically. So yeah, <laughs> but their their drummer was really cool, so that kind of made up for it. But it also did kind of ruin my, you know, memory uh, of that loving that band when I was younger. That's but anyway, um, but actually, the most memorable concert I've been to is probably when my mom took me and a bunch of my friends on a school day to go see. Um, Metallica and Guns N' Roses. What? Even, yeah, oh she, we got out of school. We um, So where we went, it was like two and a half hours away. So we all went down there. We got a hotel room. and But Guns N' Roses was like two hours late. So that, that was kind of... But I guess they were notorious for that at the time. They were always late. So, um, But that's got to be the most... You know, memorable because it was just we were all so excited. Yeah. We all love Metallica. She wins a cool mom award for that one. Oh so. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that yeah, was awesome. Man. They were probably fist fighting backstage. Yeah, or who something. knows? <laughs> I don't. Yeah. They were uh, Guns and Roses. Like there was like stories of them being five hours later. You know, crazy like that. Yeah. And, they're not known for following the rules very well. No, no, <laughs> definitely <Axel> not. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. That's awesome. So that's my story. So um. I have a question for you guys, and it comes from something that I've experienced lately. I just started listening to the band The 1975, I mean, like a couple weeks ago, and there's this one song called The City, and the I always hear the lyrics wrong. So the real line is, you want to find love, then you know where the city is. But I always hear, you want to find love, but you know you're insidious. And that <laughs> is just like hilarious to me, because... Insidious means proceeding in a gradual, subtle way, but with harmful effects. So, yeah, you want to find love, but you know you're insidious. <laughs> anyway, so do you guys have a song or, and you know, several songs or whatever where you mishear the lyrics and you're either surprised or disappointed or... Do you think by Earth, Wind, and Fire? Like, <laughs> think they've really? ever sung and or said that's come out of their mouth. <laughs> my mom used to love, I mean, and she still does, Earth, Wind, and Fire was like one of my mom's favorite bands. And so she always had like their CDs, and I'm pretty sure her and my dad have some of their like records and stuff too. And, um, and you know, when you're a kid, like, it's funny listening to it because... I mean, A, already half of Earth, Wind, and Fire's lyrics are just gibberish. Like, it's not actually words. It's, <laughs> really? like, their version of, like, scat singing or whatever they want to call it. Um, oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. But, like, it was always funny to me growing up because I would listen to those songs and be singing along and not 100% know the words. And then as I got older and actually started looking them up, I was like, oh, dang. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because I always thought that there that there was actually, like, to certain parts of it that there were actually words that went with it when... In fact, it was sounds, or it was, like, syllables, or it oh, was, interesting. you know, something else, or, like, you know, the lyrics were different, the line was di- different, mm-hmm. their song September, like, I'm pretty sure I sang half that song wrong for, like, most of my life, <laughs> until I looked it up, probably, when I was, like, 15 or 16, I was like, oh, shoot. What's their most famous song, just so I put two and two together? Are they fire? I don't know. Do so they have, like, a major hit? Yeah, probably okay. September. Um, I was thinking of Village People. They're not, like, the Village People. No, no Earth, Wind, yeah. and Fire was, like... Rock? Like, uh, no, like they're, no, they're disco. Disco. They're disco. disco. Yeah, so, so they were, I mean, they okay. were maybe in the same category <laughs> as the Village People, but they're not Without like, the crazy outfits? Like <laughs> the village they didn't people. dress up like yeah, uh, well, yeah. Earth, Wind, and Fire. The, the village People has a lot of connotations. <laughs> the, they're said to have spanned... Musical genres such as R&B, soul, funk, jazz, disco, pop, rock, oh, okay. Latin, and Afro pop. Yeah, they had yeah. a big horn section. Well, yeah, they, everything. They, they, yeah. Had, they had horns and drums and guitars and a oh, guitarist wow. and like all this stuff. Damn, that's but cool. my mom used to really like them. She used to listen to them when she was 
Nice. And Does then, you want to go? Uh, sure, I have one. Um, for probably for decades, when I was a kid, every year at Christmas, write that down, write the when the song <laughs> "Oh Holy Night" we, you'd hear, and there'd be something in the song called aeropining, which I don't know what, but like hydroplaning. <laughs> I didn't know what the <laughs> aeropining was. <laughs> and, aeropining. and then years later, I was listening to Ella Fitzgerald. It was Christmas time. Ella Fitzgerald Christmas um, uh, album, and she said. Long lay the world in sin and error pining. <laughs> and I thought, oh, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> there you go. This thing is arrow pining. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's funny. So mine uh, is actually, I don't think I made, I probably did at the time, make an assumption about what it means. I don't remember what that was. But one of my favorite, all-time favorite movies was The Crow growing up. And in every trailer for this movie, they played that Stone Temple Pilot song, mm-hmm. A Big Empty. And I was like, what the hell is he saying? It's like, time to take her. Like, it's all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And the reason, I feel like, is all because of a tricky word that's in it. It was like, it's like what the, who the hell says that? But uh, anyway, so it goes, the chorus goes, time to take her home. Her dizzy head is conscience laden. Like conscience hyphen laden, time to take a ride. At least today, no conversation. So I think just because uh, it was like a tricky kind of rare word in there, I always misunderstood. But mm. I always liked the song, so I did look up the lyrics and stuff. And then "Smells Like Teen Spirit" by Nirvana, I think, mm. was another big one that uh, I was a fan of back in the day. Didn't know what the hell. He was saying until I had the guitar book. So. I feel like you could say that about like ninety percent of Nirvana songs. And, like I love <laughs> yeah. Nirvana, and like Nirvana is my boyfriend's favorite band, and so we listened to their music a lot. And I <clears> love Nirvana, <throat> and I loved Kurt Cobain, and I loved Dave Grohl, and like the whole thing. But yeah, I feel like half the time, if you don't look up Nirvana's lyrics, you're not going to know what he's saying because yeah. the way he sings, it's very like muffled, you know. And then once you know what he's saying, you're twice as confused. Yeah, yeah. Or, <laughs> or, or disturbed. <laughs> Another one though that I didn't think about was. Uh, Mishearing when I was a kid, mishearing um, Tom Petty and the Heartbreaker lyrics. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Which ones? Because some of them are clear, like uh, uh, you don't know how it feels or whatever. It's yeah. clear, but then some of them are more. I don't remember confusing. exact examples, but I do remember, like, again, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers was like music that was always on in my house. And I actually got to see one of Tom Petty's last shows when he was at Kaboo last September. Oh, damn. Yeah, last September, because he died in October of last year. Um, and. Uh, that was really cool. But, yeah, when I was younger, I remember singing along to the lyrics with my dad and, like, getting partway through a song and then just, like, stopping singing because I couldn't understand what the lyrics were saying. <laughs> and my dad would still be, like, jamming along as we're driving. And Tom Petty was, like, real good road trip music in my house. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah my dad was way into him as well. Yeah. You know, summertime, my dad would have all the windows down in the truck, the radio uh. turned up. Free falling, blasting out of the speakers. Good times. I, I like Tom Petty's newer stuff, like You Don't Know How It Feels, and then mm-hmm. he had a few newer uh, songs that were pretty excellent, too, I thought. Yeah, I, just, I love Tom Petty. Super talented. I really dude. do. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Okay. Richard, you have a passage highlight? Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to read a passage from um, A Walker in the City. That's a memoir by Alfred Kazin. Alfred Kazin was a... Um, well, he was he was a literary critic, um, pretty well known. Uh, wrote in the New York Review of Books and a lot of other um, journals. Um, he grew up poor in Brooklyn, uh, in in a small apartment. His father was a house painter who was unemployed. It seemed like from reading the memoir, more often than he was employed. And his mother basically supported the family by making dresses for women on the little dining room table where, you know, they had to cook and where he did his homework. And, uh, where they, you know, she cooked all the food in there. So he has wonderful descriptions of, of that and how women would come and bring his mother, like, a advertising from a magazine and say, can you make me this dress? And she said, yeah, let's get the material, make it a dress. And that's how she supported the family. So obviously he didn't have a lot of money. And, um, and this passage is going to describe just taking the L train uh, to Coney Island to go to the beach one day. And so it's, you know, a, a small thing. It's not a earth shattering thing, but to him, it was a big deal to pack a lunch, take the train and spend the day at the beach. And he talks about the experience of take, of riding the train. So it's something you might think of as very simple, but it shows you how good riding can bring a mundane kind of ordinary thing to life. And uh, here we go. <clears throat> 
It was from the L on its way to Coney Island that I caught my first full breath of the city in the open air, groaning its way past a thousand old Brooklyn red fronts and tranquil awnings. That old train could never go slowly enough for me as I stood on the open platform between the cars, holding on to the gate. In the dead calm of noon, heat mist drifted around the rusty green spires of unknown churches. Below, people seemed to kick their heels in the air just a moment before being swept from my sight. With each homey crash-crash, crash-crash of the wheels against the rails, there would steal up at me along the bounding slopes of the awnings the nearness of all those street streets in middle Brooklyn named after generals of the Revolutionary War. I tasted the sweetness of summer on every opening in my face. As we came back at night along the L again, the great reward of the long parched day, far better than any mast or arid breach, was a chance to stand up there between the cars, looking down on the quiet streets unrolling below me as we passed. The rusty iron cars ground against each other, protesting they might fall apart at each sharp turn. But in the steady crash, 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 there was a coming, comforting homeward sound as the black cars rocked on the rails and more and more men and boys in open shirts came out on the top platform, fiercely breathing the wind-changed damp air. In the summer night, the city had an uneasy, un- had an easy, unstitched look. People sat on the corner watching the flies buzz around the street lamps or at the bedroom window openly yawning as they stared past us. So, um, you know, a lot of things I find really interesting about that passage. Um, I like the way the train is like the biggest character and he kind of anthropomorphizes the train. He uses a lot of really interesting um, non-coordinate adjectives like first full breath, rusty green spires, long parched day. Rusty iron cars, comforting homeward sound, winch change, damp air, easy un- unstitched look. And I also noticed he unstitched and his mother, of course, was a seamstress, so I thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah. But, um, so, anyways, but I mean, just there's so much atmosphere in just one paragraph. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so, much, so many literary techniques being used. That's that was really cool. interesting. Plus, that was our first uh, passage highlight, so yeah. we'll kick off that segment. <laughs> nice. Okay, so we'll move on to our main topic, which is music and the writing process. So um, we kind of left this open to however you want to interpret it. Sure. Um, anything you want to talk about regarding writing and music. So, um, Nick, do you want to start? Yeah, I don't mind starting us off. Okay. So I've been a lifelong fan of music, and it doesn't really apply to everybody, but for me, the lyrics do matter. For me, if a song has uh, lame lyrics or they don't resonate with me, it's not going to be one of my favorites, even if I like the riffs or whatever. So uh, there's, in all genres, there are cleverly written lyrics. Obviously, you know, the majority of music you hear on the radio may not be so clever, but uh, there are extremely... Clever bands in different genres. So I'm going to give an example of clever writing from my favorite rapper, Machine Gun Kelly, where he uses a couple metaphors to get his point across. And then I'm going to go kind of deep on Tool, showing how three of their different songs are all a trilogy based on a tragedy that happened in Maynard James Keenan's life. So first off, Machine Gun Kelly is a rapper, writes a lot of his own stuff. I uh, was a former heroin addict, pulled his stuff together, and uh, now he's very successful. So in the song Alpha Omega, in the second second verse, he goes, Paranoia got me using these meds. Now I'm smoky as Chris on a Friday like Craig. Retract that statement, I'm stony as Fred. Okay, so you can see in there, just from that, do you guys know what he's referencing? Just from hearing that? Where he goes, uh... Smokey as Chris on a Friday like Craig. That's a reference to the popular Ice Cube movie, Friday, because yeah. those are the characters in that movie where he Bob gets Felicia. he gets uh, Chris Tucker Stone. And then uh, right after that, he's like, retract that statement. I'm stony as Fred. So he's making a reference yeah. to Fred Flintstone, who everybody knows. And uh, so without just directly saying... in the Stone Age. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. He's stony as Fred. So without directly saying, hey, I smoke, he's saying it through these metaphors. 
And you'll see thousands of these across high-quality rap. People like Kendrick Lamar, Machine Gun Kelly, a lot of talented rappers use a lot of metaphors and even double entendres and things like that. So rap can be extremely cleverly written. And now I'm going to get into another side of the spectrum, uh, Tool. They're a progressive rock band, but really they've been my favorite band ever since I was 14, and the lyrics are a major part of it. Once I realized that a lot of their lyrics have to do with uh, philosophy and human evolution and sacred geometry and things like that. It really kind of got me into, you know, trying to understand some of the meaning of the songs and stuff like that. So basically, there's three songs that might not make sense to anybody unless you knew this connection, unless you knew this context. That there was a major tragedy in Maynard's life. He's a lead singer, Maynard James Keenan. And, um, That tragedy was when he was 11 years old, his mother suffered a stroke, and she was paralyzed from then on. So all these songs are pretty emotional in different ways, especially the last one I'm going to talk about. But through the songs Jimmy, Judith, and 10,000 Days, I'm going to briefly explain how he's addressing this situation from different angles. And again, if you heard these, you would never know what the hell he was talking about. Uh, no problem. Machine Gun Noises and <laughs> Machine Gun Kelly. That's right. No, not our Machine yeah. Gun Kelly. So in the song Jimmy, which came out well over 10 years ago, I believe it was on his Anima album, he uh, really starts bringing this up. And you even know, since he grew up, James Herbert Keenan was his real name. Jimmy is like a childhood nickname for James. So already that's a hint that, hey, maybe he's talking about his childhood. And he is just in a very, you know, kind of vague way how it's written but once you know this tragedy happened in his life where his mother was paralyzed then it all makes sense in all these different songs so the lyrics he says in jimmy he was like what was it like to see the face of your own stability suddenly look away leaving you with the dead and hopeless 11 and she was gone 11 is when we wave goodbye 11 is standing still and he's like moving me with a sound opening me within a gesture drawing me down and in, showing me where it all began, 11. So when he was 11 years old, this traumatic event happened, and the song just plays out, basically saying what an impact it had on him and all that. But unless you know that that happened in his life, then you would never know the meaning of that song, most likely. So then a few years later, he starts A Perfect Circle, his other band, and this time arguably their biggest hit, Judith which is named directly after his mom, this addresses in a much more aggressive way. And in this one, he's kind of blaming God for her situation. And more so, he's almost attacking her faith. Like how, when you were dealt such a tragic lot in life, are you still so faithful? And he just is asking that in an aggressive way. So you can see in these lyrics here, he's like, Thank your God, your Lord, your Christ. He did this, took all you had and left you this way. Still you pray, never stray, never taste of the fruit, never thought to question why. It's not like you killed someone. It's not like you drove a hateful spear into his side. Praise the one who left you broken down and paralyzed. He did it all for you. So as you see there, it's very powerfully written. The song itself is powerful. And uh, he's really just approaching it from another angle about how can you be so faithful in this situation? So finally, he brings this tragic trilogy to a close uh, by naming his last, most recent album, 10,000 Days, and arguably their most epic song on there, 10,000 Days. Um, What 10,000 Days is, is the amount of time his mother spent paralyzed before she died. So it's roughly 27 years that she was paralyzed. And the song is an absolute uh, epic song. No two parts are the same. It's 11 minutes long. And they've admitted that the music is based on math algorithms. So like not even two sections are the same. And and, and lyrics and music, it's just extremely powerful. And uh, what's remarkable about it is he's doing a full 180 from Judith. The song's basically a love letter to his mom. And he's... He's showing admiration for her faith, and he even hints that maybe his entire religious outlook has been swayed by his mother, all in the song. So, just briefly, he says, What are they going to do when the lights go down, without you to guide them all to Zion? 
What are they going to do when the river is overrun, other than tremble incessantly? High is the way, but all eyes are upon the ground. You were the light in the way they'll only read about. I only pray heaven knows when to lift you out. Ten thousand days in the fire is long enough. You're going home. And then she's like, you're the only one who can hold your head up high, shake your fists at the gate, saying, I have come home now. Fetch me the Spirit, the Son, and the Father. Tell them their pillar of faith has ascended. It's time now, my time now. Give me my wings. And then finally, in the very last part where the song really gets aggressive, he has a catharsis where he basically admits his mistake, and it's like his final goodbye to his mother. He's like, Set as I am in my ways and my arrogance, burden of proof tossed upon non-believers. You were my witness, my eyes, my evidence. Judith Marie, the unconditional one. So basically that song serves as a love letter to his mother and uh, gives meaning to this trilogy of songs that are all about this tragedy that he endured in his life. So that's just an example of how writing and music can have a super deep meaning and a meaning that you might not even realize at first and so you look into it more. And Tool's definitely famous for that. All their songs have multiple meanings and stuff like that. So, anyway, it's my expl- explanation of clever lyrics by Machine Gun Kelly and Tool. I didn't know that about those. I didn't know that story. You're aware of the songs, though? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They, I never put it together, so that's pretty cool. He also went to military Thanks. school for a while. Yeah, he was at West Point, and the song Four Degrees mm-hmm. has multiple meanings because uh, Army. Uh, Soldiers were used to be nicknamed four he actually, degrees. He actually went to a West Point prep. He never actually got. He never. He didn't take his appointment to West Point. He decided to pursue a music career instead. But he wanted to go to art school. He wanted to get the GI Bill to fund his art school career. Oh, yeah, really? That's interesting trivia. Also, my brother met Maynard James Keenan at a grocery store when he was uh, signing bottles for his winery. So I have a bottle from his winery at home signed by Maynard James Keenan. He you know? gets really protective of like his. Um, Persona, like his celebrity, because yeah. he doesn't like the way that like celebrities go about their business, and he yeah. used to carry around business cards that said Jesus H Christ on. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah, he's known to be a smart ass. Uh, in a lot of ways, I read that as well. That's cool. He recently had a daughter. Also, he has a son too, right? Yeah, he does. Yeah. Named Debo, and he's on. He's uh, like my age, I think. Yeah, he's he sings vocals on a Thirteenth Step. It's a perfect circle CD. I mean, for me, you know, the lyrics are definitely an important part of writing, but music in general, whether it be, you know, to inspire your own writing or the writing that other people put into their music has always been something that I've loved and paid a lot of attention to. Um, And I think because I spend so much time listening to music, it definitely influences the way that I write. And not so much here because that's a little different, but my outside writing a lot of the times when I look at the way that I break up paragraphs or I break up sentences or the way the sentences work together, there's something almost very like metered and lyrical about them simply because I constantly have music playing. Like constantly. I can't count the number of like headphones and speaker systems I've blown out just because I use them so much. And it's not that, you know, it's always like an insane volume, but it's like over time I just... I use them so much. And when I was, so oh, I don't know, probably like 15 or 16, my dad bought me a nice set of, like, Bose speakers. Oh, those um, are high quality. To have in my room when I still lived at their house in Colorado so I could listen to my music while I was doing homework and things like that. Um, and those speakers are probably six or seven years old now, and they're the only set I've had that have lasted more than like two or three years and they're still going strong um they've made it through like seven or eight moves in that time and like (laughs) they survived it was great but um yeah i think you know music not only serves as as you know an outlet in writing in and of itself but a way to inspire your own writing um you know and don't get me wrong there are some songs that i listen to not necessarily because the lyrics are super profound or anything like that but because the way that they're written is just catchy and it makes you want to sing along and it makes you want to dance and it makes you want to they just make you feel good they make you feel happy like Desposita yeah you know like some of these songs that when when you try to break down the lyrics they might not necessarily have any other meaning than just 
getting you up and getting you moving, making you feel happy. I feel that way about a lot of Justin Timberlake songs. Mm-hmm. Like, I love Justin Timberlake to death, and he does have some deeper songs, but most of his songs, the entire point of them is just to yeah. make you feel happy and just, yeah. like, make you feel yeah. like you want to dance. And, like pop music. And be in a good mood and things pop. like that, you know? And, um, you know, I think there's a time and a place for lyrics and music like that as well, just as there's a time and a place for songs that really make you think and stop and, and process and... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I, I tend to listen to a lot of both, especially when I'm writing. And it's funny because looking back at some of my writing, I can tell exactly what, like, musical phase in my life I was into <laughs> when I wrote it. <laughs> because there's just, like, there, there's, like, a pattern or a tone to it or something. Or you're like, oh, yes, the punk phase. Oh, yes, the Blink-182 phase. Oh, yes, <laughs> the, the pop phase, the country phase, the whatever. And now... That I'm older, I still listen to a little bit of all the music that I did growing up. And when I was very, very young, you know, my musical taste was very much influenced by what my parents listened to. Yeah. My dad was very, like, light rock kind of guy. He listened to, you know, a lot of Coldplay and a lot of things like that. His favorite radio station, you know, Coldplay, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, like, all that kind of stuff. And um, it's funny because the radio station he... I'm pretty sure has not changed his radio dial in his car to ever <laughs> a day in his entire life. Yeah. Um, every year they release like a live studio <clears throat> CD. And so they have all these artists that come in and record live kind of acoustic versions of popular songs from that year. And the CD also always gets released around my dad's birthday, which is the first week in December. So every year for his birthday, me and my sister would put on like 12 layers and go stand out for like three and a half hours <laughs> in the snow to get this CD with my dad. And even now that CDs are kind of like almost dead and defunct at this point, Mm -hmm. he still goes out and does it every year. I mean, now it takes him like 15 minutes. There's no line, but there was something about it where like mom would make a thermos of hot cocoa. You know, we'd be out there in our winter jackets. It's December in Colorado. So Mm -hmm. it's like 10 degrees outside. And you'd be standing out there for like two and a half hours and dad always bribed us with like, well, if you come, we'll go out to breakfast afterwards. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's interesting to bring up your dad's music because my dad was just here and we were doing a run somewhere and my Pusha T rap CD came on and he's like, you know what? I never mind rap sometimes. I just don't think it's music. <laughs> he's like, and he's like, he's like, there's no guitar. There's no instruments. He's like, how's it me? And I'm like, well, a lot of it's the lyrics, the, the clever lyrics, like how he just said he got blackballed, but he doesn't care because he's Jack Frost is selling that blast off. That's clever. That's a clever, <laughs> clever lyric about, you know, he's a Coke dealer, so he didn't care. Yeah, and I'm trying to explain. He's like, I guess so. And then I'm like, and choosing the beat that you use. There's some creativity in that. That's music. And he's yeah. like, all right. My, uh, my parents, like, their music taste definitely kind of influenced the fact that my music taste is so eclectic, much like you were like, your range goes all the way from, like, Metallica to Slaughter. Mine goes all the way from, like, Metallica, ACDC, Guns N' Roses to, like, modern-day pop music to, like, 90s country and everything in between, including rap and hip-hop and, yeah. like... Damn near everything. Yeah, everything. Like, yeah. I I hate these people who get, like, stuck into this thing of, like, I can only listen to one genre of music. I don't like one Yeah, or people music. from their decade. Like, I know, uh, like, my dad, like, he'll listen to still Pink Floyd or, like, oh, just the... And that, they're Floyd. great. They're great, but... <laughs> He just, like, won't care about a newer band. Like, oh, well, Vengeance Sevenfold, you might like them. Or Arcade Fire. And, like, no, nah, I mean, my, only uh, the stuff he's familiar with. But it's funny because, like, my, my dad has always been, like, you know, he was very, oddly enough, he really liked Neil Diamond when he was younger. Don't mm-hmm. know where that came from. But, like, <laughs> you know, his, his taste in music goes everywhere from, like, Neil Diamond to, like, modern-day Coldplay and, like, yeah. the Foo Fighters and Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers sure. and the Blowfish, like, all that kind of stuff. And then my mom is, like, jazz and opera, like, Andre Bocelli. She listens to him all the time when she's cooking. Mm. Jazz, Andre Bocelli, Spanish music, Earth, Wind, and Fire, and Merle Haggard. <laughs> <laughs> You're like... It's a wide range of tunes something. there. something... Yeah. You know, it's like Michael Fronty and Spearhead. Sure, like, sure. So their music class, tastes were always very eclectic. Very eclectic. So there was always, like, it was always up in the air what kind of music we were going to get to listen to when we were in the car or at home. Or like, yeah, that's true. And it's funny because I associate certain types of music that they listen to with, like, certain activities that they would do. Like, mm-hmm. my mom, when she's cooking, she's always listening to jazz or opera. Yeah. Um, if she's driving, you know, it's usually something a little bit more modern. It's Michael Fronty and Spearhead, things like that. If she's cleaning, it's, like... 
Or so the fire music has different like, purposes yeah. and yeah. stuff. Yeah, and so like, I could understand. walk into the house and hear the stereo system and be like, oh shit, mom's cleaning, leave before she asks you to help. <laughs> right. You know, and like, or oh, yeah. mom's cooking, maybe I should go down and like lend a hand and like, you know. So that was pretty but, cool. I always mm-hmm. found Janet Jackson and the Rolling Stones were best for housework. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> really? Definitely. Those were nice. both popular in my house. I usually listen to podcasts for housework. housework. Those are good too, because you can yeah. listen and. Yeah, now, yeah, see, yeah. I start doing housework and I listen to music, and then it turns into yeah. like a house cleaning dance party where like you're <laughs> you dancing go. with the like it's yeah. like a cheesy movie where you're like dancing with the vacuum and like yeah. <laughs> singing into the <laughs> yeah, exactly like Tom Cruise. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Really cool. oh, yeah, that's a risky business. I thought you meant Tom Cruise jumping on the couch when Katie Holmes said yes to him. Or oh, what? yeah, that's it. He was like. She like, said yes. It's like, dude, act like you've been there. Before. Act like you've had a you're girlfriend before. What are you doing? Yeah. He's Tom Cruise. He's, before, he's yeah. just oh, never, oh, like, oh, well. he's never been the cool guy. Despite Every, the fact that everything he's Everything's cranked up to, like, 20 when most people are, it's like, It's funny. So. They were actually, um, they started filming Top Gun 2 here in California on Coronado Island a couple weeks ago. Oh, yeah. Like that. And I was like, I kept, I, my boyfriend works right downtown. And I was like, if you want to meet Tom Cruise, go stand outside the giant Scientology church. Oh. I guarantee you he'll show up. Yeah, good like, point. Probably 10 out of 10, there. you'll see a black sedan roll up and Tom Cruise will get out probably of the Probably have his own entrance underground. Yeah. Or they probably only let you in if you're clear. Yeah, you probably won't you get, get in if you're clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Because right. you're probably not the only one who thought of that. I'm probably not. Yeah, but, that's clever. Yeah. And it's it's funny because while they were filming it, me and my boyfriend were down at the Dell on Coronado Island. And so we were like, oh my God, is he staying here? Should we go try to find him? He's <laughs> on Tom Cruise. Yeah. We were like, no, he probably Probably gets, not a good idea. Probably yeah. wants some space. Yeah. He probably just says a helicopter pulled yeah. down and jumps onto the ladder <laughs> and sails <laughs> off yeah. into the, yeah. onto the film set. My boyfriend made the point of like, I probably owns a house out here in California somewhere. And I was like, oh, fuck, you're right. <laughs> yeah, or a neighborhood. All right, Richard. Okay, well, I'm going to do an Alan Iverson and call my own number and talk about some lyrics that I've written. Um, nice. I've talked about this before, so I, I'll say it as briefly as possible. I started my blog because I I was working with some kids, and I saw the way that Shel Silverstein poetry really affected them, and I thought, well, geez, I, maybe I could do that. So I started reading books about meter and verse and started writing children's poetry, started sending them off to the publishers, read every book about how to get your book published, every book about how to write a good cover letter, and in response, I got two boxes full of rejection letters when they bothered. A couple times, in nice little encouraging notes. Um, finally, I said, you know what? I'm just going to start a blog. I started a blog. After a while, I started running out of these. So then I started writing other, you know, I started writing nonfiction, I started writing articles, I started art things I'd written in graduate school. A lot of these things did start ranking on Google to this day. There's about a dozen searches where I show up in the first page. Sure. Um, and some of them are some of the children's literature. Some, and, and by the way, so I'd start writing things and I'd, be, I'd say to myself, first of all, this isn't for children. And then I'd say, and this isn't exactly um, a poem. It's more like a song. And one way you know the difference between a poem and a song usually is the meter. Poetry is very often very iambic, which means na 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 na. I cannot go to school today, said little Peggy Ann McKay. I have the measles and the mumps and gash of rash and purple bumps. <laughs> now, if you listen to the underlying meter, that it's na 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 na. Now. Music can be iambic. I mean, for instance, um, Shelter from the Storm by Bob Dylan. Um, suddenly I turned around and she was standing there, silver bracelets on her wrist and flowers in her hair. She walked up to me so gracefully and took my crown of thorns. Come in, she said, I'll give you Shelter from the Storm. If you listen to the underlying beat, that's na 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 na. That's seven lines, seven beats per line. So it can be, but usually with music, it's more like na 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 na. It's usually like two beats and th- two syllables and three syllables and two syllables and three syllables, kind of mixing, like going back and forth. It's not straight, just iambic, like every other, every other, uh, every other n- syllable is a beat. So mm-hmm. I started writing uh, some of these, and um, some of these do rank to this day. I still haven't. Nobody's written me and said, "Hey, I want to be your." Um, hey, uh, hey, I'm, I'm a songwriter. I'm going to make music to it. You know, <laughs> yeah. I still haven't happened. Meet me tomorrow, you know, whatever. So you converted your poems to songs. Well, no, basically, 
I have different categories. One is children's poetry, another is poetry for more serious, and another is just lyrics, basically. Oh, okay. And so, but and I remember sometimes I'd write something, and I'd, my, my girlfriend she'd edit a lot, and I'd say, "Do you think this is a song or a poem?" <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, so some, but usually, like right away when I know, I, I'll I'll show you some examples. I'll, first, this is sure. a poem. I'll read a poem, which is I put in the in the poetry and the children's poetry category. It's kind of humorous. I hope this to, to this day. If you go to Google and type in the words "ode to feet." This will show up about third or fourth okay. in, in the search. I was just about um, to search that. Yes, uh, of course, because <laughs> um, you're thinking about your feet. Um, for some strange reason, th- this gets a lot of searches in Ireland. I don't know why, <laughs> but somebody in Ireland must find this amusing. Really but, but, but this is an example of just a, a poem, and you'll tell, you can tell that the meter is pretty iambic throughout. Um, okay. Considered alone, they're simply two foots, but together they make up my feet. They endure wherever I take them. This pair is hard to beat. Daily, I pound them with pressure. And each time I walk down the street, the entire weight of my body comes crushing down on my feet. Cruelly, I encase them in sandals or stockings and shoes. At home, I keep them in slippers, protecting from fixtures that bruise. I wasn't designed to walk upright, but you won't see me swinging in trees. I'm resisting all primeval yearnings. To return to the salty old seas. <laughs> Supporting my frame for a lifetime, they're loyal and faithful and strong. Through corns and fungus and bunions, my friends keep moving along. <laughs> I'm planning on keeping my tootsies. I'll treat them with kindness and care. Publicly now I salute them, this most deserving pair. <laughs> oh, damn. So that's an example that good, of poetry. Thank you. Um, you. Covered a lot of aspects of... Uh, the, yeah, well, I think I... That, that's, I think <laughs> damn I, near all of them. <laughs> I think I started out just kind of brainstorming um, things about feet and then how many I could get in there. That's really um, clever, man. I like that. Thank you. Um, so now, now the two examples of... The two examples of songs um, that I'm going to pick, I'm picking them because currently they are searching, they're getting a lot of traffic. Well, not a lot, but a little bit every day. Sure. Um, this one, for some reason, people all over the world, it might be good. This one actually is the picture that I chose with it. I showed them the other day. Yeah. The, the, both the lyrics and the picture of Rank Type, but especially this picture. So if you Google the words, Broke me bad. This picture of this guy in the hoodie shows up. Funny thing is, this isn't my picture. I don't own it. I found it on Google Images. Yeah. And but I still rank for the picture when when people put the words to my song. So, but I mean, if, from reading both these songs, you'd think that I'm crazy and really depressed. Um, which I, <laughs> yeah. At various times in my life, I have been. Yeah, who but hasn't? Who hasn't? <laughs> but um, it's and I'm picking them not because they're representative of my complete body of work, but because. <laughs> They seem to be popular, okay, which tells you more about the human race than me, okay. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, this is, and you'll notice them, but this, you'll notice when you listen to the, to the, to what the song, that the, 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 the beats aren't as constant and they aren't as regular. Oh, okay. They're kind of more spread out. Because when you listen to a song, um, uh, that's that's usually how a song works. It's da 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 da. You know, um, I'm actually I'm reading. Um, I'm reading, that was memories, I'm reading uh, uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber's memoir, and when he first wrote the song Memories, his father was a composer and he head of a music department, classical music department at a college in England, and when he first wrote Memories, the, the song seemed so familiar, he thought that he plagiarized it. And so he, he played it for his dad. He says, what does that sound like to you? And his dad said, that sounds like a million bucks to me. <laughs> I think it's it, multiple millions of dollars, you know. Nice. Um, it's, you know, da, 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 da. But, you know, when you, you notice how, like, certain beats, you have to have a, a meter that fits the, the beats, where, where there'll be stresses on the, on the beats of the music. I'm not a musician, so that's about as deeply as I can go into it. Gosh. But, okay, anyways, I'll, I'll do a couple of songs that have gotten, um, and again, um, don't call my psychiatrist after you hear this. Um, okay, she broke me so bad. She broke me so bad I'm drinking beer for my brunch, and a bottle of whiskey is all I have for lunch. She broke me so bad I fell apart and lost my job. I'm begging on the corner. I swindle and rob. She broke me so bad my anatomy stings. She got me seeing monsters and hearing crazy things. She broke me so bad my life is such a drag. Got a heart torn and tattered like a dirty old rag. I'm lost and I'm loaded. 
I'm sick and I smell. I get all, I gave all my sweet loving to a demon from hell. <laughs> so that nice. one is, um, gets a lot of attention. Every word of that resonated with me. Oh, uh oh, uh oh. That was scary. Um, and finally, um, Felt like you were reading a chapter out of my life right there. Uh, I'll be with it from the ancient past. Uh-huh. Yes, that was for me. I know sometimes people will. I'll write something on my on my blog like that. And, well, are you okay? Yeah. yeah. And uh, I'm like, no, that was like high school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Plus the suicide hotline number. Yeah, yeah, call yeah. the suicide hotline <laughs> number. Um, I'd like to so, that logic song. Okay. And this one I wrote from a female perspective. It's called Love Him So Much, Hurt Him So Bad. And it starts out with a short uh, epigraph from Richard Wilbur where it says, And I wonder sometimes, what is it in me that hates me? Okay, so love him so much, hurt him so bad. He was a perfect man every woman wants to meet, loving and honest and friendly and sweet. I love him so much, I hurt him so bad. Beat up his sister and slept with his dad. I love him so much, I hurt him so bad. Took all his money and burned down his pad. I love him so much, I hurt him so bad. Left him disabled and totally mad. I love him so much, I hurt him so bad. Something inside me just has to be sad. Damn. So, anyways, again, that's not a representative <laughs> sample of me or my life. Those are just the currently two of the more popular. Can we get pads in this room. Yeah, yeah. 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 get some pads. Yes, um, some. Um, I'm actually going to be reading something about suicide a little later when we do oh, our last passage. But, anyways, um, I guess. Oh, I'll say one more thing. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting in, in lyric writing and song writing. Um, well, there's a Ira Gershwin, who is George Gershwin's brother, who wrote. Um, wrote the lyrics to a lot of his songs and then after George Gershwin passed he continued to write songs for a lot of other songwriters yeah. he usually doesn't get his due because George Gershwin was such so brilliant that people kind of overlook the lyrics that went with his music um, but Ira Gershwin tells a funny story where he was doing jury duty and at the end and, and he found I think he found it against the, the plaintiff and so afterwards, he's trying to get out of there, and the plaintiff lawyer like flags him down and grabs him. And he's thinking, "Oh my, oh man, this guy's going to give me a hard time because we found it against him." But that's not what it was about. The guy said, "I have to ask you. I have to ask you which comes first, the words or the music?" <laughs> and um, it's kind of funny because most, as far as I can tell from my brief survey of this, most, um, most. It's usually the music first because you, you hear the music and then you have the stresses and then you have the words kind of fit to the music. Yeah. Elton John and Bernie Taupin did it backwards where Bernie Taupin would write the words and then he'd give them to Elton John and he'd try to make a song out of them. And he said about 90% of the time he could. Sometimes he's like, sorry, can't do it. Um, but generally speaking, that the music does come first. So I'm kind of doing okay. it backwards by writing the words first. But people um, do buy lyrics uh like a lot of pop stars don't write their own stuff, so they would buy oh, yeah, their lyrics yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. put it with whatever music. And right, yeah, it. yeah. Um, so that's pretty cool that you write lyrics and put them out there. So you never know, you might get lucky. Yeah, I'm, I'm still so waiting. Gomez uh, might uh, I'm, give I'm, you a I'm, call. I'm, I'm still waiting for the, uh, you know, the quit your day job yeah. you know, call, but I haven't gotten that. I think uh, Stain uh, might be yeah, interested yeah, in the yeah, first one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, Carol King. Ariana Grande. Uh, Carol King. Um, when she wrote, I guess she wrote with her like her boyfriend at the time. Will you still love me tomorrow? And it became a hit. And I it gets, he was working as a chemist, and she and there was such a big hit. She said he quit his day job. <laughs> <laughs> nice, yeah. nice. All right, so all right. Mean? I guess I'm up next. Um, well, music has always been really important to me. I guess like a lot of people, it helped me get through high school and all that. <laughs> um, and I used to play the violin and viola, a little bit of guitar and a little bit of piano, but not so much, you know. Um, so I, I guess I really, really like songs that tell a story or you can really get to know the artist through the lyrics. And, um, and I think... You know, I think my my taste in music is a lot more eclectic even than from Metallica to Slaughter because some days here I'll start out the day listening to this yoga kirtan music. I think that's how you pronounce it. And it's basically like, um, it's a lot of it's in Sanskrit, but it's always telling a story about, you know, something yoga-based. Going on a downward dog? <laughs> yeah, not quite that, but more of like the philosophy and everything. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, but some of them are in English, some are in Sanskrit, so, um, but they're always based on, you know, telling some kind of story, and I think that's cool. 
Um, and then all the way from like listening, I'm listening to my favorite band, The Cure. <laughs> and Tool, I love Tool, um, Depeche Mode, Tori Amos. Goes all over the place. I guess maybe the only thing that I don't like so much is country music. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've run into a lot of people who are some, like, I like anything but some, country. Yeah, there, there's some. Just um, yeah. But what I really wanted to talk about was um, Bob Dylan because he's, I think, like ultimate you know storyteller, writing lyrics. You know, it's um, and I don't know why I didn't know this, but I just read the other day that he received the 2016 Nobel Prize in Literature. I don't know why I never heard that. That was kind of a big deal. Yeah, I, mm-hmm. I think around that time I was just like so busy. I didn't really, yeah, I don't know, but I missed that one. Um, but they said that he got it for having created new poetic expressions within the great American song tradition. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, I had a friend in college who just loved Bob Dylan. So we would, we had photography class together, so we would always like spend all night in the dark room printing pictures and listening to Bob Dylan. So I think that's when I really fell in love with his music. Um, But, like, some of the lyrics, like, uh, (laughs) some of them are kind of funny, even, like, um, the song Idiot Wind. He says, Idiot Wind, blowing every time you move your teeth. You're an idiot, babe. It's a wonder that you still know how to breathe. (laughs) I just love that one. And um, Bitter much, Bob? Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Exactly. Um... And from Maggie's farm, I try my best to be just like I am, but everybody wants you to be just like them. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, Raging Against the Machine remade that one. Oh, yeah, they did, didn't yeah. they? I just heard that. Yeah. I love uh, Maggie's farm, right? Yeah. She talks to, she's talking about Maggie. Ain't going to work for Maggie's mono more. Mm-hmm. He talks to all the servants about man and God and law. Everybody tells me she's a brains behind Pa. Mm-hmm. 68, yeah. but says she's 54. Yep. Are you going to work <laughs> yeah. on Maggie's farm no more? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, the lyrics really... You know, like Tessa said, there's some songs that you just listen to because they sound good and whatever... Um, but for me, it's just like those kind of songs, like more poppy songs, I guess they just don't go as deep. So I, I always want to know what the song is about. Like when I was like 13, 14, 15, when I really loved Metallica, I would really get into finding out what every song, like all the lyrics were and <laughs> what it meant, you know? Um, so I think that makes a big difference. And then my other, you know, my all time favorite band, The Cure, um, they, their songs just like range all emotions and um, no matter what you're like they're known as being a goth band and dark but they have some really light songs too and happy songs even um, but uh, like one lyric that I always thought was really cool is um, from the song Jumping Someone Else's Train it's everyone's happy they're finally all the same because everyone's jumping everyone else's train <laughs> yeah Nice. So, yeah, I guess I don't have much more than that. So I think we'll move on to our discussion questions. All right. Sounds good, guys. Those were all really interesting. So my question, first question for you guys is, uh, without mentioning a band that's already been mentioned, what's a band or a song uh, that you would highlight as having overall excellent uh, writing in their songs, whether songs are just every every new song that comes out, you're just – Happy. I mean, the writing is just like, wow, that's really clever, or whatever the case. For me, I would say uh, Pearl Jam, I think, always had meaningful, kind of interesting, poetically written songs, regardless of their uh, where you are in their discography. They have a lot of uh, CDs out. And then recently, I think Arcade Fire has some really original kind of songs, too, in addition to their music being... Uh, original as well so what do you guys think i think for me it would have to be 21 pilots oh yeah i i have always liked their music but i really fell in love with it a lot more when i saw them perform live on snl Mm -hmm. when they were the musical guests last year something like that or maybe it was two years ago now but um it's funny because again you listen to their music and the beats just like they're easy to dance to. They're easy to, you know, sing yeah. to and things like that. And then you actually take 
time to like sit and listen yeah. to their music. And um, it just, it's so beautiful. There's one song that they wrote about, um, I'm trying to remember which one it was. There's songs that are really like, oh, vulnerable too. House of Gold. House of Gold was written for the um, singer's mom oh, and about okay. how he always wanted to give her everything. And the, um, the, the chorus of it goes, um, I will make you queen of everything you see. I'll put you on the map. I'll cure you of disease. And the opening line goes, she asked me, son, when I grow old, will you buy me a house of gold? And when your father turns to stone, will you take care of me? Oh, wow. And it's just like this beautiful homage to like his love for his mom and everything she did for him. And I don't know, all of their songs are like that, where even though they do make you want to like get up and dance and have a good yeah. time, like you listen to the lyrics and they're just so personal and so, so incredible. So I think that would definitely be mine. Nice. They are good. And their, their music, like... Uh, has different types. Like mm-hmm. it's pretty complex too. Like they'll slow down and do a rap section, and then go back to. Yeah, and yeah. it's it's funny because a lot of the times I hear bands that I really like when they go on SNL, and they ha- sound absolutely horrendous. Mm. They right. sound awful. I don't know if it is the acoustics of that stage or like modern day bands just Damn. don't really have any actual talent without oh. like. Yeah, the DJ. Pilots, it's like you could not tell the difference between them live and when they, when you listen to them on on, on an album. And for yeah. me, that's like the mark of someone who's truly talented. Awesome. Um, and so yeah. I recently saw Drake's performance on SNL. Thought it was really good too. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about Drake sometimes. Like sometimes <laughs> I really like him, and sometimes I'm like, all right, get out of here. I'm done with you. <laughs> Um, yeah, a few years ago, I saw Allen Ginsberg, the poet before he died, um, uh, one of the famous uh, the beatnik poets, and he he somebody said, "Well, what do you th- in music?" And he said, "Oh, Beck has really got great lyrics." Yeah. So I'm not talking about Jeff Beck. I'm talking about the guy. Yeah, Beck. I'm talking about the guy who stole Beyonce's uh, Grammy. Uh, <laughs> Which but, okay, bullshit. But like, who even knew who he was at that point? Uh, Nobody. Well, a no, lot Beck, of people. Beck was a big um, star in the nineties, yeah, but loser. Yeah, 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 he was. Played a lot. But when and then when he, he had uh, the two turntables and a microphone. Oh, yeah. when, yeah, so. But when he won that Grammy, like I don't know, he just he's a one man band. Well, though. He, he does just, every instrument. Yeah. He just seemed to come a little bit out of nowhere. Well, he does that every one, single I'm not instrument. saying that he's well, not. One thing, one thing about is. Grammys, Grammys have always been kind of wacky because they're voted on by American studio musicians. Yeah. So like people, not English artists, like like the Rolling Stones never won a Grammy. Like some girls lost to the Saturday Night Fever album. And the Beatles, I think, won like once or twice. And the Beatles lost the best new band to the Oak Ridge Boys. Country. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the, it's always been the, like the Grammys have always been like kind of a little strange and kind of a little quirky as far as who went. But Beck is pretty amazing, you know, and that was a good album. And it was the kind of album that a lot of studio musicians would say, hey, wow, that's an amazing album. I think that's why it's surprising, though, yeah. is because from the outside world, like, we're always going to vote for the Beyonce's, the Bruno Mars's, like, the ones that just, like, you're constantly bombarded by their music. And mm-hmm. don't get me wrong, Beck is an extremely talented musician, and I love his music, and I love his lyrics, and yeah. it's true, you know, with him playing every instrument, it's incredible. But, again, it was not this one is of rare for him to win. Uh, it was not one of those albums where, like, people who are not, you know, in the studios, yeah. judging all of these albums, would probably have guessed, which is why when he won, the entire internet was like... Another another what thing that plays happened? a role is how long somebody's gone without getting the reward. Just like you'll see, like, Diane Lane of the Academy Awards or whatever, been passed over for five yeah. years, and then finally for, like, a mediocre performance, they'll be like, oh, yeah, give it to her. They gave one so to John there Wayne. might be that They gave one situation. to John Wayne when he thought he was dying of cancer. He never would have gotten one otherwise. Right, yeah. right, exactly. Um, so. But, um, yeah, sometimes they're, like, lifetime achievement. One time Paul Simon won. He, he swept the Grammys, you know? Oh, really? And, and he, he walked up and he said, I'd like to thank Stevie Wonder for not releasing an album this year. <laughs> 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 but anyway, let me just give you an example from the song Scarecrow by Beck. Because um, sure. I, I mean, I, I remember a few years ago I read an anthology of, of new poetry, and I would say this, what I'm about to read, is better than 90% of the yeah, stuff. Yeah, Beck's a good writer. Anthology. Um, Walking to the other side with the devil trying to take my mind, and my soul's just a silhouette on the ashes of a cigarette. Illusions never fake their lives. Trick cards fool the eyes. 
Carry zeros over till they add up. Bury tears in the chapters you shut. Sometimes a jail can't chain the cell, and the rain's too plain to tell. All alone by a barren well, Scarecrow's only scaring himself. Mm. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Very enigmatic. So I really need to pick one that hasn't been mentioned. <laughs> yeah, damn it. <laughs> There's been so many about, mentioned. But I was going to talk about a perfect circle. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Tom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've brushed we over did, that. Yeah, we, we just Nobody worked. talked about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, just, you mentioned it. Okay. Sure, yeah. Well, let's start yeah. I love a perfect circle. So, so I've been really, really loving their new album. It's called. Um... <laughs> oh, that one with Doom Eat the on Elephant. It? Okay. Yeah. So they have a song on there called um, So Long and Thanks for All the Fish, which I think is awesome because it's a um, reference to um, to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy in that whole series. Oh, yeah. damn. That's what? cool. Yeah. I hear that series. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, in, and, you know, I think. Like, that band is supposed to be um, <clears throat> James Maynard Keenan's, like, softer side. Yeah, it is. He, he described yeah. it as tools as more masculine yeah. side. Yeah, APC is yeah so that's side. always, like, really intriguing to me. So whatever. And and it was so long since he, they came out with an album that, yeah. He's really that's clever with it, too, because Mir Dinam means sea of names, and every song was named after a name oh, right. in his life and yeah, stuff. So yeah. he's clever with, like, putting the whole package together. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, and then, you know, he's kind of tells stories in his lyrics, and it's really, you know, the lyrics and all, the, even tool songs and perfect circle songs are really important, so I would say, yeah. Although I had to kind of struggle there. I'm like, what am I? I don't need to know. So, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, so I'm going to settle right. on, so. Well, that's okay. an awesome one for sure. All right, cool. So uh, how important is it to you guys? How important is meaning? To you guys, like if you hear a song you like on the radio, are you the kind that's gonna like listen to it, to try to figure out where they're coming from? Or are you more like, okay, that's catchy, never another thought about it, or somewhere in between? For me, I was always a curse and a blessing of me is that I always go deep on things, like sometimes more than I should, or more sensitive than I should be a lot of times. And that, like I said, it's a curse and a blessing. And for me, the meaning is almost always important. Like if I get where you know the singer's coming from with something and it resonates with me, then I might listen to it on loop, for instance. But uh, for me, I would say it's on a one to five scale. I would say the meaning is either four or five a lot of times. So what about you guys? Is uh, the meaning of the song? Do you guys go that extra layer to see? Okay, what the hell are they singing about? It depends. As I said, like there are some songs that you just listen to because they're fun to listen to yeah, in the moment. You just, yeah, you just want to have like. Smile on your face, driving home on Friday afternoon, like, whatever. And then there are some songs where, like, for example, with 21 Pilots, like, you listen to it, and it's easy to just kind of push it, push it off as just like, oh, there are another, you know, another band out there whose music mm-hmm. is good and, and things like that. But then you kind of dig into why they write their songs, and it's, there's, you know, that whole other layer to it, writing about wanting to be able to give his mom the world and, like, all these things. And you're like, oh, he's a mama's boy. And, like, suddenly you start to know these people better than you probably should considering they're celebrities and you've never met him a day in your life, but suddenly you know that he's got all this respect for his mom and he's got siblings and, you know, listening to some of their other songs, you know, you, you learn about like what kind of car he drove when he was a teenager and like all these things. And it's, mm-hmm. it's like it's makes it a cool. richer experience. It's uh, kind of cool. Yeah. Him, so, right? I'm going to say both. I'm going to talk to be a weasel and talk out of both sides of my mouth. And, you know, we don't always have to assign goals. You know, pop song can save the world or it can be about peace and important things and war. And, you know, back during the Vietnam, songs like War, What Are They Good For? And One, Two, Three, What Are We Fighting For? And songs that wouldn't be played on corporate radio today um, were very important. I mean, they did change the world. So That Buffalo Springfield right, song. Right. Uh, uh, something uh, happened. And here. also the one that they wrote about um, uh, Ohio, Tim Soldiers and Nixon's Coming for Dead in Ohio. About Kent State, so they were, you know, popular music can influence culture. But on the other hand, we don't need to sign this goal where it's got to be meaningful. And deep, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's um, true. you know, Paul McCartney said some people want to fill the world with silly love songs. What's wrong with that? I'd like to know. And you know, silly love songs have their place. You know, sure. I don't, it don't. You guys don't tell anybody this, okay? But you know, guilty pleasures, um, like 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 I, you know, like I love the song "All for Love" by Color Me Bad. I'm sure if I read the lyrics of that song, <laughs> it wouldn't change anybody. 
everybody's life, you know. Right, but right. It's, it's great song. It, it celebrates love, and it's great for doing housework, you know. <laughs> so I mean, you know, you, they're different songs for different moods or different That's points. points. And we don't. Not every song has to change the world or have this deeper meaning. It's wonderful when if you can take a pop song, which is a very you know, tight genre, which and, and fit deeper meaning into it. Um, that's amazing. That's wonderful. And that's great. And you are influencing the way people think. But not every song has to change the world. Yeah, um, I agree. And just I, like movies, there's yeah. a you're right movie exactly. for everyone. Yeah. Some movies are just funny. You know, you know, Caddyshack is funny. Deadpool's never going to save anyone's life, but it's hysterical. Well, that's what really well written too. <laughs> it is. God, it's it's in a comedic Reynolds, way. So yeah. funny. Mm-hmm. But really funny. I don't know, and I think there's a time and a place for songs like that, right? Where it's like. Sometimes you don't want a song to drive you to like digging into that deep layer. You just want a silly love song that's you know gonna yeah. be good for doing housework, gonna be good for listening to while you're writing, you for know, sure. whatever it may be, you know. And well, the meaning of tool actually he explained before is that it's a tool for I believe the word was lacrimology, which means inspiring you to cry. So all their songs, that's the mindset, and that's how he found a tool. It's like a tool to lead you to be more open and vulnerable and that kind of thing. Which a lot of just listening to it, you might not think that, but that's uh, when they founded it. That's how you Because the word tool has other connotations. Mm-hmm. Which won't go into it. has them. a lot of connotations. Yes. Yeah. I always find myself like poppy songs that might not, like that I like, that it might not have the best lyrics I, or a deeper meaning. I always want to find it, right? Sometimes <laughs> yeah. I get frustrated when there isn't. I'm like, oh, and then I just have to like not even listen to the word. And writing, I I think there is a a place for both. Sorry, and writing lyrics for a silly love song takes a lot more craft than people realize. If it was easy, everybody would do it. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I don't know if I have much else to say about it, but yeah, I think I always am trying to find a meaning. That's my brain goes there too. So like Justin Timberlake, all you're doing is bringing sexy back. Come on, there's nothing to do. Justin Timberlake, okay, that works on. That's a good example. That works on so many different levels. <laughs> <laughs> he can do no wrong. He's allowed to do whatever the hell he wants. It's like white Michael Jackson, basically, right now. Perfect oh, cool. example. Yeah. But, but I mean, well, there's a line, and I'm not going to go too deeply into it, in, um, well, maybe, in, in, yeah. in a honky tonk woman where he says, She blew my nose and then she blew my mind. Oh, which yeah. has like three or four different ways you could actually oh, yes. read yeah. it, you know? So there, sure. there, even in, in pop songs, you can find like different. Yeah. Ways yeah. of looking at things. Awesome. Yeah. It's funny, I don't know why this just popped into my head, <laughs> but um, I was watching, because as I said, I love country music, opinions to yourselves, whatever. Sure. <laughs> but I was <laughs> watching, their, they have like, you know, their annual award show, just like most music genres do. Backstreet Boys are coming back, and they launched. They oh, yes. released a new song during the CMT Awards, Come on. and it felt like flashing back to the nineties. I heard that the, the dance day. moves, the fog machines, the coordination, uh, the mics. So the country band. now? No, no, no. Oh, it's still they like were just them, performing there. but they were there because they had done a mashup with a country band, and yeah. so they were asked to perform, and they did like a world wide release of this new song that they're coming out with. What? But it literally feels like, other than the fact that they look a lot older, it literally feels like they haven't aged. Other than the fact that they're 47. No. Coordinated <laughs> dancing, the head mics, the high-pitched oh, singing, the whole thing. Wow. I thought yeah. they, didn't they already did this? Because they did I mean, New Kids on the Block, in sync, and back. Yeah, well, that's right. Boys it's a trio. Already. It's a trio. They already did that tour, it's, like, recent years. It's trilogy. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah. The Backstreet Boys. The Boy Band trilogy. The Backstreet Boys are back, and apparently they're not done yet. Uh, oh, so yeah. Backstreet's back. You know, yeah, Backstreet's back. <laughs> you know, it's funny right. because, um, no. <laughs> you, you know, Mick Jagger, I, I Mick Jagger said <laughs> once when he was young, he said, the last thing I want to be doing is singing Satisfaction when I'm 40. You know, like yeah. I know. Yeah. That and, and now he's seventy-five and he's still yeah. singing. He's That's admirable. Oh, That's admirable. It? it was a few years ago. He did a performance on some award show. I don't remember if it was the Grammys or something. And yeah, he was like seventy years old, still trying to dance like he was twenty-five. And I was yep. like, dude, no. <laughs> well, he runs like five miles a day, keeps himself in good shape. So Which, why not? Like, yes, but still, like <laughs> you just have to accept you're getting older, Mick Jagger. He's like, okay. nope, I'll do this shit. You're not like thirty years old now. <laughs> yeah. Like you're done. Well, yeah, and there's like what's that old Shella or whatever? They had that kind of. Oh yeah. yeah. And like oh, Roger, yeah. Roger Daltrey taking his shirt off, and people like, right, come on, dude. <laughs> it's like, like take it back a notch, Roger Daltrey. Aside from the dancing. 
it's just like as you get older your voices change and so like don't get me wrong, I love Paul McCartney, I love Mick Jagger, but they're losing the ability to sing like they used to. Yeah. And they just don't sound as good as they used to. And so while I can appreciate them still wanting to do these things, like, it hurts my ears, please stop. And then the nostalgia <laughs> plays a major <laughs> role, though, like, oh, oh yeah. you can still go see the New York. Like, they want to see Paul's their stars. Fest. Yeah, House well, Fest is amazing. It was yeah. like Paul McCartney when the Olympics were in London. He was part of their opening ceremonies, and he sang. And... Again, it wasn't as uh, love Paul like McCartney, him in his prime. Love the Beatles. Yeah, he cannot sing well at all really? anymore. Damn. Like he's lost it. It's like so, uh, it's like it's just it's kind of time to like leave it to the album. Yeah. It's like that Neil Young it's not and like Nirvana. You need any more money? Oh. It's like that Neil Young and Nirvana lyric. It's better to burn out than to fade away. Because yeah. some of these people are like, I'm not singing until I'm eighty. Yeah. Well, it's it's like, so, and I mean, some of them can. Like, there's definitely been singers out there who. For whatever reason, their voices just don't seem to die. And so they can keep going until, you know, they're like 70 years old. Wow. You know, and like... Tony Bennett still sounds Tony awesome. Bennett still oh, sounds amazing. Yeah. And that dude's but like... But yeah, I don't think he tours, but maybe a little bit, but he doesn't. Yeah. He doesn't try to sing like a rock star, but he still does albums. Yeah, and yeah. Still, it still, it still sounds, sounds good, amazing. but like there's... Yeah. And maybe that's it. Maybe it's that they can do it, but when they go and do these big live performances, they just strain it too much, yeah. and it's like... Yeah, I really prefer that you're not and let me have the good memories. Yeah. It takes a but. lot to be put on the spot, your voice perfect, you feel great, to belt yeah. that out, I feel like. I mean, it's funny to me because they keep doing this and it's not like these people need the money. Yeah, well. <laughs> like, calm yeah. down. It's, it's just funny. making that legacy Too much bigger. is never enough with yeah. money. I mean, people just... I've always heard it's like a drug, too, for musicians or even, uh, like, comedians getting on stage. You might be in front of thousands oh, of people yeah. making them laugh and then the next day you're just a random nobody. It's like a drug. Uh, severe it's highs and lows. That's yeah. why a lot of people like that end up doing drugs because that's the only way they can simulate that that same you yeah, know that high, endorphin rush for sure you know? yeah. Yeah. cool so you know, start start our okay um in. yeah um we went long i gotta mm-hmm. get back to work right. um anyways um i'm gonna read by the great dorothy parker um this song is about suicide which has been in the news lately Absolutely. um oddly enough um she and she tried to kill herself twice unsuccessfully fortunately and odd, oddly enough, this song is is actually a little bit life affirming, which is a word generally not um, associated with Dorothy Parker, who's rather dour and, and dour and kind of negative and depressing in many ways. But it's called resume. Razors pain you, rivers are damp, acids stain you, and drugs cause cramp. Guns aren't lawful, nooses give, gas smells awful. You might as well live. <laughs> there you go. Nice. Same direction. Amy? Okay, me next. Okay, I'm actually going to read some lyrics from The Cure. It's from the song Disintegration. And now that I know that I'm breaking to pieces, I'll pull out my heart and I'll feed it to anyone. I'm crying for sympathy. Crocodiles cry for the love of the crowd and the three cheers from everyone. Dropping through the sky, through the glass of the roof, through the roof of your mouth, through the mouth of your eye, through the eye of the needle, it's easier for me to get closer to heaven than ever feel whole again. Oh, oh awesome. Yeah. Talk yeah. about the ultimate angsty band. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's considered the godfather of goth. Uh-huh. Yeah. But like He's the godfather of like angst. They have, in general. Uh, Robert Smith. But they have some nice like, happy... They do. Yeah, yeah. Friday I'm in love. It's funny though because That's you like true. listen to The Cure and like... And I mean, even Friday I'm in love, like if you think about it, not yeah. the happiest song. <laughs> yeah, but like, a... don't get me wrong. Like, I love The Cure. I do, but sometimes, like, listening to their music, I'm like, damn, I am just not in the mindset in my life right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. So my quote is, uh, it's actually a tattoo on uh, my favorite rapper, and I thought it was so profound that I actually have it written up in my office, and it plays on that whole living in the present thing, which I like so much, and it's uh, live every single day. As if you'll never see it again. Nice. So I like that. that yeah. just has a simple, profound message. Nice. Mine's actually going to be part of a 21 Pilot song called Car Radio. And it goes, I ponder something great. My lungs will fill and then deflate. They fill with fire, exhale desire. I know it's dire my time today. I have these thoughts so often I ought to replace the thought with one that I, with what I once bought. Because somebody stole my car radio and now I just sit in silence. Oh, nice. Very cool. 
Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Check back every week for new episodes. We can be found at nowmediagroup.tv backslash rogue dash writers. You can find more from Richard at laughter, hope, sock in the eye, more from dot com, more from me at uh, livinglifepetite.com and some great interview, interviews on Boo Foods Facebook page. Thank you to Dirty Rose Productions for our intro and outro music and have a great week, everyone.